All right. So yeah, I'm, I'm one of the PGY4 residents in ophthalmology. Um, and a lot of the things we see every day in clinic are things that you're probably seeing in your patients and referring to us. So thank you for the referrals and hopefully this is helpful for you. Um, so first we're just gonna start with a little bit of anatomy about the eye and that will help us um, as I go through some of the conditions that you'll typically see. So here um, is, a, is a, can you see my pointer? Yeah, okay. So if your eyelids here, um, upper and lower with the eyelashes, the white part of the eye is called the sclera. Then you have the iris, which is the colored part of the eye. And the pupil is that opening between the iris that goes into the back of the eye. So a couple important structures. The conjunctiva is a, is conjunctiva, um, is a very thin layer of cells that lines the front of the sclera. So it covers all of this white sclera. So it's the outermost layer of that eye. Um, and it contains glands that secrete some fluids that help lubricate the front surface of the eye in addition to lymphoid tissue. Um, so you can get lymphomas in this part of the eye. Um, oops. Next, you have the sclera, which as I mentioned, is the right, white part of the eye. And here in this photo, you can see it wraps all the way around um, the eye itself. Um, it's the tough outer coat and it maintains that globe-like structural integrity. And the extraocular muscles, as you can see, you have the superior rectus and the inferior rectus here. Um, there are six muscles actually that attach to the sclera here um, and help move the eye. Uh, the cornea then is the clear part of the eye. So you have the sclera, the white part, the cornea starts here around the limbus. And it's this whole clear part of the, of the front part surface of the eye. It's like a window and it refracts light um, along with the lens, which is right here. So you have cornea and lens and the light will come in the eye and be refracted back perfectly to the macula, the center of the retina in the back of the eye. And that's how you get sharp vision. Next, you have the anterior chamber, which is this space right here between the cornea and the lens. Um, and this is filled with aqueous humor, which is just, just a thin liquid. It provides nutrients and oxygen to the cornea. Next, you have the iris, which is here. And on this photo, it's the colored part of your eye. So blue-eyed, brown-eyed, um, green-eyed. Um, it's a neurosensory membrane. It sits between the cornea and the lens. Um, and it will control the amount of light that enters the eye. So if you're in a dark room, you'll notice that your pupil um, is larger. The iris is contracting. And it's allowing as much light as possible to go into the back of the eye. Um, versus when you're in very bright lights, your iris is gonna be um, smaller. It's allowing more, less light into the back of the eye. Um, so that's meiosis and mydriasis. Meiosis is a small pupil and mydriasis is a large dilated pupil. And next, the lens right here, um, this is located right behind the iris and you have your ciliary body here, which secretes the aqueous humor that fills the anterior chamber. And then you have little zonules, which are like little, little fibers that hold this lens in place. Um, and it changes its thickness to accommodate. So when you're trying to read up close, um, it will change its shape to be more prolate, so more um, pointed outwards kind of, so that you can focus light more. As you age, you're not able, the lens will develop a cataract and will become thicker um, and won't be able to change shape as much. So that's why older patients can't accommodate and read up close, they need to wear reading glasses. Um, so as we mentioned here, presbyopia is that diminished ability to change the focusing distance of the lens. Um, age also causes this lens to go from being like a clear window to a cloudy window. And that cloudiness is what we call the cataract. Um, the retina is the back part of the eye. Um, so before you hit the retina, when you go from the lens to the back of the eye, there's this jelly that's filling this whole back of the eye. Um, it's called vitreous humor. It helps maintain the shape. Um, but as you age, it liquefies. So if you think of a gelatin, when you take the gelatin out of the refrigerator, it starts to liquefy and pockets will collapse on one another. That's kind of like what happens here in the vitreous of your eye. Um, so as it liquefies, that's called cineresis and you can get a little uh, vitreous detachment from the back of the eye. That's different than retinal detachment. Vitreous detachment is just when that jelly is kind of falling off the back of the retina. Sometimes it can pull the retina with it and create a hole, um, which would require um, ophthalmology to pro probably laser. Um, you can get bleeding sometimes, but 90% of the time as it liquefies, it's just gonna fall off the back of the retina. And that can give patients, um, patients will start to note floaters. So a couple of floaters here and there are benign, nothing to worry about. It's just that vitreous collapsing on itself with age. If a patient has a lot of floaters, all of a sudden, um, that's a more ominous sign that you'd wanna send them to us um, and would indicate you know, something more serious. 
The retina then is the light sensitive innermost tissue lining of the eyeball. It's a neurosensory retina um, and it detects and absorbs the light that's refracted from the cornea and the lens. So it's focusing it all back here. Um, here's your optic nerve and here's your macula. That's the center of your vision where you're seeing your sharpest vision and the fovea is the pinpoint um, in the center. Um, the retina contains photoreceptor cells that collects the, the light signals and then it sends it through the optic nerve head here back into the brain. Um, and the retina is composed of two different types of photoreceptor cells, the rods, which give you night vision and the cones, which give you day vision and give you your color vision. So what are some common ophthalmology conditions in the elderly? I like to group it into different categories. So you have infectious such as your conjunctivitis, your herpes zoster ophthalmicus, you have um, lid involutional changes, so malposition and trauma, which can lead to ectropion or entropion, which is when the lid is um, falling off the eye or turn in and hitting the surface, the cornea of the eye. Um, and orbital fractures, of course, are very common. The bones of the orbit are very thin. Um, so falls can, can elicit orbital fractures. And then age-related changes, so cataracts and glaucoma. Lastly, metabolic changes, diabetes. We see a ton of that, especially here in our hospitals. Um, lots of very uh, advanced diabetic disease in the back of the eye leading to blindness. Okay, so we'll start with conjunctivitis. So this is inflammation and swelling of the conjunctiva and the blood vessels. Um, it does represent about less than 5% of ED visits um, are eye related, but a large uh, proportion of these are conjunctivitis actually. And there are three major types to be aware of, viral, bacterial, and allergic. Um, so all of these are gonna present with redness, discharge, and irritation, but the timing is a little bit different on all of them. And the discharge can be a little bit different as well. That can help guide you into what the exact etiology is. Um, so you can have hyperacute, which is gonna be sudden onset, very purulent um, drainage coming from the eyes. As soon as the patient wipes the eye, it's going the whole eye is going to reaccumulate in front of your eyes. Um, and that's really classic of Neisseria gonorrhea. So if you have a patient that just has tons and tons of purulent drainage from the eye, um, you want to think of that. Acute is less than four weeks. That's more common of viral and chronic more than four weeks is more common of allergic um, and seasonal um, conjunctivitis. So here's just a table with all of them. Viral is most common in the summertime. Um, these patients will have a history of someone in their house being sick. They may have viral prodromal symptoms, so fever, chills, cough, runny nose. Um, and they're gonna have more of watery eyes. They're gonna complain of tearing. They may have some buildup along the lashes, but for the majority, they're gonna complain of tearing. It's, their eyes gonna feel a little uncomfortable. It'll be red. Um, they may have some lymphadenopathy when you, when you check. Um, and they could have eyelid edema and usually it's not so itchy. Bacterial is more common in the winter and in children. Um, same thing, they may have some sick contacts. Um, you'd wanna ask about um, sexual history in these patients, um, especially if you're worried for a gonorrheal conjunctivitis. Um, they're gonna have more mucopurulent, so thicker uh, drainage coming from the eyes, um, and they can also have eyelid edema. Allergic is more seasonal um, and they'll have that typical, you know, the allergy symptoms, atopy, that kind of thing. And they're gonna have more watery um, tearing versus that purulent drainage. Um, and that's more of a chronic picture. So here's a picture of viral conjunctivitis. Um, close to 50% of acute cases. Yeah, most, the majority of conjunctivitis is gonna be viral that you see in the ED. Um, I'd say actually higher than 50%. Um, it's more common in the summer. Um, adenovirus is the most common culprit of this, but HSV can also cause a good number of viral cases as well. Um, as we mentioned before, often you will have that viral prodrome um, with lymphadenopathy, fever, pharyngitis, and upper respiratory tract infection symptoms. Um, you'll have more of that watery to mucoid discharge, and it will often start in one eye and progress to the other. It's extremely contagious. Um, so if a patient presents just, with just one eye, um, with this viral conjunctivitis, I often tell them that in a couple of days to expect it will go to the other eye. Um, so um, hand hygiene is super important. I tell patients to wash their pillowcases, um, 
to not touch other people, just be very careful, don't even touch their face, don't rub their eyes, that kind of thing. Um, adenoviruses, probably you know, can live on surfaces for quite some time. And the treatment for these patients, you know, it's a virus. So antibacterial eye drops are not going to help. We often see these patients are sent to us from the ED and they've been started on um, ophloxacin eye drops. And that's really not gonna do anything for them because it's a virus. So it's more supportive care. Um, we, uh, patients usually like cool compresses that can help for the symptoms. Um, preservative free artificial tears can also help um, just for symptom if they have some discomfort. Um, frequent hand washing and disinfecting the surface, surface is very important. This can take a couple of weeks to get better. So when we see them here, we often don't bring them back for about six weeks. Some patients will get better in um, you know, one to two weeks. Some may take up to five to six weeks to get better. So they just kind of have to hang in there. Um, this is a patient I actually saw last week, just to show you the, the difference in severity. Some people will just show up with, um, you know, very mild conjunctivitis, but this patient, you can see his lids are almost swollen shut over here. And when you open, he has this watery drainage and the eye is injected 360 degrees. This is a viral conjunctivitis. It could often be confused for um, like an orbital cellulitis, but in this patient, I wasn't so concerned because his vision was intact. His eye movements were normal. He wasn't having any double vision. He didn't have any fevers or chills. Um, there are certain signs for, for cellulitis that you would look for that he didn't quite have. This is more of a viral conjunctivitis type picture. So for him, I just recommended supportive care and I actually saw him last week and he's doing much better. Bacterial conjunctivitis, as I said, um, has a lot more thick purulent drainage. This is actually not so bad in your gonococcal patients. They're gonna have, it'll be everywhere. Um, you can't miss it. Um, common in children and immunocompromised, and you'll have that purulent drainage. Ask about sexual history, and it's usually hyperacute, so it comes on all of a sudden. Um, sometimes it can be self-limiting, um, but if it's the hyperacute version, you definitely want to give them a fluoroquinolone eye drop. So we like to give ofloxacin. Moxiflox is great. We don't have it on formulary here at this hospital, unfortunately, but it's a great option. Um, and then if you're worried for the gonococcal, um, you know, you want to give them IM ceftriaxone and uh, in addition to the topical fluoroquinolones. And on these patients, when you pull their eyelids down, you can see these mounds on the, the palpebral conjunctiva. And those are, that's basically lymphoid tissue, um, a reaction to the viral infection. So in a normal eyelid, you wouldn't see these mounds. It'll be very smooth. Okay, next, um, herpes zoster ophthalmicus. So this is caused by reactivation of zoster from its dormant status in the dorsal ganglion cells of the CNS. Um, the virulence um, and immune status of the host are the primary factors that lead to this. So we see it often in HIV patients or really elderly, sick, immunocompromised patients. Um, it's also becoming more common in patients over 60 um, years of age. And the severity in older patients um, is higher than younger patients. Um, with, the in, with the use of the vaccine now, um, it's reduced um, the amount of patients we're seeing with this in the ED. Um, so it's important that these patients are receiving those vaccines. Um, a recent study showed 50% decrease in the incidence of zoster and um, also about less than 70% reduction of post-herpetic neuralgia. Um, so here's, here are just some photos of zoster ophthalmicus. Um, usually you're gonna have that prodromal fever, malaise, headache, you can have eye pain, and this will often be before the eruption of the skin rash that you typically see. They'll complain of eye pressure and tearing, redness, decreased vision, pretty nonspecific symptoms. Um, but you will notice that they'll have pain in that certain trigeminal nerve distribution. Um, and here's a photo. You notice this patient's lesions are, are unilateral. Um, all on the left side of the face. And we often see it here in the V1 distribution. They're all crusted over. This patient's had it for quite some time. Um, and when you do a slit lamp exam, you're gonna see this little staining pattern. These are pseudodendrites, um, pathognomonic for zoster ophthalmicus. And the other picture was that as well. Um, so management of these patients, they are especially Especially if they're immunocompromised, they need to be admitted for IV acyclovir. Um, an ID consult is also very important. You can start them on topical urethromycin uh, ointment for the skin lesions, and then you want to treat their pain as well. So amitriptyline usually works well. Um, we usually leave this up to the primary team, um, but many patients do suffer from this post-herpetic neuralgia. 
Okay, the next topic um, is lid malpositioning. So, oops. Ectropion. So this is outward turning of the eyelid margin. Um, and there are a couple of different types. I'll show you some pictures coming up, but you can have congenital ectropion in babies, um, involutional, so that's age-related, paralytic, um, so if you have seventh nerve palsy, cicatricial, so if they've had previous um, surgeries that have caused scarring that kind of pulled the eyelid down out of position, and then mechanical, um, if they have eyelid swelling or something like that, and I'll show you some pictures here. Um, so this is an example of involutional ectropion. Um, you can see here, um, this patient's eyelid is drooping forward and you can see that palpebral conjunctiva. The other side you don't, you shouldn't see this inside part of the eyelid um, and her eyelid's basically falling open. And because of that, when she closes the eye, she's not having great lid closure. So she's gonna have dry eyes. She's gonna have symptoms of that, which would be um, burning, foreign body sensation, blurry vision. Um, and she'll also have tearing because your tears drain through the punctum um, which is a little opening, an ostium here in the lower eyelid. And so if that hole, if that ostium is not well opposed to the globe, the tears are just going to run down the face. Um, so that just exacerbates the, the dry eye. Um, so this is the most common type of ectropion. And it usually results um, from lid laxity. So you can do a snapback test as shown in this photo where you pull the eyelid out and you'll notice it takes a while to snap back. If you try it to yourself, you'll see that your skin pops right back. Um, but in these patients, their, their eyelid is very lax and it doesn't go back to the globe as it normally should. Um, because of that, you'll have exposure of the conjunctiva as you see in this patient. It's gonna hypertrophy, it will become red and injected and it will start to keratinize. So this is more of like a mucous membrane type um, interface. And if it's exposed, it's gonna start to keratinize, which is bad. So the treatment for this um, is surgical. We we do a lower lid tightening procedure. It's called the lateral tarsal strip, where we take a piece of the lateral part of the eyelid um, and we, we kind of cut it off. And then we re-suture the eyelid to the periosteum, which is the bone of the lateral orbit. Um, and it tightens the lid and pulls that lid back onto the globe. Um, for patients where the punctum, as I mentioned here, is that little um, drain for the tears that goes down the nose, it connects in the nose. If, if the punctum is not well opposed to the globe, we call it punctal ectropion. And there's another procedure there where we can um, tighten from the inside and pull that, that drain back onto the surface of the eye. It's called a spindle procedure. Another important thing to note is floppy eyelid syndrome. So there's a strong association with this, um, with floppy eyelids, with uh, obstructive sleep apnea. So any patient we see in clinic that has these really floppy eyelids, um, that are kind of falling open. Uh, we usually send for sleep tests. It's important. So if you ever see a consult from us for that, that's why. Um, and it's important they're treated for that. Paralytic ectropion. Um, so this is when the eyelid's flopping open and it's due to etiology such as Bell's palsy, which is idiopathic cranial nerve seven palsy um, or any causes of cranial seven nerve palsy, facial nerve palsy. So that could be compression from a tumor. It could be uh, trauma from a prior surgery, um, an ENT procedure or a neurosurgery procedure or something like that, um, or post-viral. After um, herpetic infections, it's often to see that we often see uh, seventh nerve palsy. And there's actually been more um, cases of this after COVID as well, causing seventh nerve palsy. Um, so signs of this, um, you can see here, this eyelid is not closing properly, that's an ectropion. And when the patient tries to close the lid, they're unable because they're paralyzed. The seventh nerve innervates the orbicularis muscle here that closes the eyelid. So that's why you're having that droopiness. So you have lag ophthalmos. Lag ophthalmos is when you have this opening here and poor lid closure, and it's gonna lead to reflex tearing. You can have inferior keratopathy, so exposure of the cornea down here leading to dryness. Um, it can get so dry that it will start to thin and you can even perforate the globe. So lag ophthalmos is nothing to sit on. You always wanna send it to an ophthalmologist. Um, you can get brow ptosis. So if you look at her two brows here, her left brow is um, depressed compared to the other one. That's because the seventh cranial nerve also innervates the frontalis up here. So she's had paralysis of the, um, the upper and the lower face here. Um, you always want to check for sensation. Um, so V1 and V2 um, sensation um, can, if they have 
deficits in that can lead to earlier, earlier corneal decompensation um, because those nerves are responsible for sensation on the cornea. And in a normal patient, if your cornea is dry and you're not having good lid closure, it will cause you to blink more. Um, but if those nerves are out, they're not sensing that the cornea is dry and it will not tell your eyelids to blink more. So you're gonna become dry, you can thin and you can perforate again in that condition. So treatment for these patients, um, because this muscle is paralyzed, a surgery to tighten the eyelid is not going to do anything. It's still not going to move. Um, so we have to be more aggressive with them. Aggressive lubrication, so ointments at night, artificial tears every two hours. You can do a temporary tarsography, which you see in this patient, which is where we sew the, the lateral side of the eyelids closed so that you have better lid closure. And then permanent interventions would be a lower lid tightening procedure in addition to a permanent tarsorophy, which is where we permanently close, uh, suture the eye closed. Or you can do an upper lid gold weight. Um, so that's when we suture in a gold weight to the upper lid and it's basically adding um, weight that will pull the eyelid down and cover the, the cornea that's being exposed. Important to know if you ever see a patient that has a gold weight implantation in their upper lid, they can still have an MRI, it's safe to have that. Um, so this is an interesting patient I saw recently with a cranial nerve seven palsy. Um, and what I want you to know- Open is your eyes, look straight at me, and now close eyes. them. Close your eyes. This eye is not closed at all, and look at all that corneal exposure. She has a hypopia in there, which is inflammatory cells. You can see the whiteness there. This eye is drooping open. She has this mucopurulent drainage. She was extremely thin. She was at, at risk for perforating. She was actually admitted at a different hospital for a couple of months um, for COVID and, and incidentally had a lung tumor, metastatic tumor diagnosed, and she was in the ICU and, and people kind of forgot about her eyes. And we were called when she was this late stage. Um, so she was in bad shape. We, we did a temporal tarsography on her. And you can see here when we asked her to close her eyes, okay, she can close. still see through a little medial portion here. Um, open but again. The, eye, the globe is much more protected with this. And this is just temporary. She subsequently had uh, definitive treatment with the gold weight that we put on top and we tightened her lower lid. So she's doing a whole lot better. This was also something that was diagnosed as a Bell's palsy initially. Um, but it turns out she had a metastatic lesion in her ear canal that was causing compression of the seventh cranial nerve. So if you ever see a patient with, um, with drooping of their face, really important to not rush and just call it a Bell's palsy to make sure you do the full workup and determine why, because that can really change your management. Okay, cool. Okay, so that's ectropian where the eyelid's outward. You can also have in entropion, which is inward turning of the eyelid margin. And there are similar, there are a couple different types of this as well, congenital, involutional, which is with age, cicatricial, so that scarring after surgery that can kind of pull the eyelid in from the inside, and then spastic. And the most common is involutional that we see in our older patients here in clinic. And here's an example. You have the eyelid turning in, and subsequently these eyelashes are hitting the front part of the eye and it can cause scratches on the cornea in front of the eye that can be painful, lead to foreign body sensation, tearing. It can also predispose the patient to infection because it's a break in the cornea and bacterial pathogens can get in there. They can develop ulcers and really nasty infections. So you never wanna leave a patient with eyelids um, like this where the lashes are hitting the cornea. And your patients will tell you it's very painful. Um, so why does this happen? So same thing, horizontal laxity, you wanna do the snapback test here, um, can cause the eyelid to turn in. Um, this may be out of the scope of this talk, but lid retractors, that's a muscle in your lower eyelid and the, the posterior part of the eyelid that helps with opening and closing of the lid and they can disinsert. Um, and so it can kind of pull the eyelid inwards. Um, you can have overriding orbicularis muscle. So your preceptal orbicularis is this most anterior part of the lid a couple of different muscles in your eyelid. It can be pretty complex that help open and close the lid. But if you have um, the orbicularis here, the anterior portion of this muscle kind of pushing over and overriding, you see that a lot in younger kids, um, but you can also see it in adults pushing the eyelid in. So you can do a surgery there um, to correct that. But the main thing to take away from this is that you can get surface irritation. And here you can see this is a defect of the epithelium of the cornea. Um, it's staining here with fluorescein when we put the fluorescein in. Um, and so the lashes are disrupting that there and it needs to be treated. Um, 
Treatments can be temporizing. So there's a type of suture that we can use that will evert the eyelid again, and that's just temporary. Ultimately, we need to do a type of lid tightening procedure on these patients or repair those um, lower lid retractors that I was talking about before. Okay, next topic is gonna be trauma. Um, and orbital fractures are very common. We see them every day here in this hospital um, from falls, um, often in the elderly as well. So here's your orbit, the coronal CT scan view. If you ever have a patient coming in, you're concerned for fracture, you probably all know this, but x-rays are not a good study for the facial structures. There's too much going on there and you won't get um, good images. So you need to do CT scan without contrast. Um, and so these are all the extracular muscles you can see here, the superior rectus, medial, inferior lateral. And here you can see the orbital floor. This is normal here, um, but here that he's had a fracture um, where the intraorbital contents are now protruding into the maxillary sinus, which is right here. There are a lot of bones that make up each orbital wall. I won't go into it, um, but the thinnest bone of the orbit is the lamina papyrisha, which is over here, and it makes up the orbital floor and also the medial walls. So the most common types of fractures that you'll see in these patients are floor fractures and um, medial wall fractures. Um, lamina papyrisha uh, means tissue paper thin, so it's very, very thin. Um, so common um, resulting from falls. So the patients are gonna complain plane of tenderness, edema of their eyelids. They may have diplopia, so binocular, meaning when they use both eyes, if they cover one eye, the uh, double vision will go away. Um, and I'll explain why that happens. Crepitus, so they may have, um, when you palpate, they'll have crepitus because they have emphysema um, in their skin from, from lacerations or from air getting inside the orbit. Um, they can have tearing. So like we mentioned before, there's a drain in your eyelid called the punctum right here in the medial aspect. And if you've had um, involvement of fracture or laceration of the eyelid that involves that punctum, um, that leads to the nasolacrimal duct. So your tears drain down that way. If that's violated, then the patient will have tearing because the drain has been disrupted. They can also have epistaxis, especially with those medial wall and um, orbital floor fractures because direct communication with the sinuses. And lastly, they can have trismus, so lockjaw. They can have malar flattening, so that's this bone here. If they have um, um, inferior um, orbital rim fractures, um, zygomatic arch fractures, um, they can have palpable step offs when you're pressing. These are all things we'll look for on our exam, but um, you know, just so you know. Um, and, and the most severe thing that can happen is optic neuropathy. So it could be traumatic um, if you have sharp trauma, so a knife going into the orbit or blunt trauma can cause um, an optic neuropathy as well. Um, so that's why you always wanna check vision on these patients. Um, they can also develop it if they have orbital compartment syndrome, which is when they have retrobulbar hemorrhage. So that's um, an emergency and you'd wanna call us to, to evacuate that hemorrhage. So management, the main thing here is before calling a consult, you wanna start ice packs on these patients, pain control, um, morphine will cause uh, meiosis so small pupils um, and make the fundus exam difficult. Um, so, you know, these, these are painful, it's a fracture, so it's painful, but most patients do pretty well um, with, you can just start them with Tylenol and then escalate from there if you need. Um, you wanna evaluate the eye grossly to see if there are any injuries other than um, the fracture, so do they have any lacerations around the eye that may need to be repaired? Um, is the globe intact? Does it look like normal contour? You see there's a laceration on the globe and the globe is shallow um, and it's been perforated. You wanna to attempt to check vision in pupils. Um, if they have a non-reactive pupil, that's a very ominous sign, um, intracranial hemorrhage, something like that. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, CT is the imaging of choice here, no, no x-rays. Do CT orbits max or maxillofacial without contrast is fine. And we like these studies because they're one millimeter slices. If you do a CT head, that's five millimeter slices. And our structures, we need that, that very thin slice to really tell what's going on. So that's why we like the CT head doesn't really do much for us. And you wanna place the patient on telemonitoring. 
And that's because if you have a fracture that's caused entrapment of one of the extraocular muscles, so one of the muscles has gone down into that fracture and is now trapped there, there's such thing as an ocular cardiac reflex, where um, when the patient tries to move their eye, if that muscle's entrapped, they can um, become bradycardic and brady down all the way into asystole. Um, so any patient that's had a fracture, we like to place them on telemonitoring so that when we check their extraocular movements, we're also looking at the heart rate. That would be a surgical emergency. Um, so like I said, if the muscle's entrapped or you're concerned for ruptured globe, that's an indication for emergent surgical repair. If there's no entrapment, if the muscles are moving fine, the globe is intact, um, there may still be some restriction in the movement of the eye. If there's a lot of swelling, that's okay. We sometimes give steroids to help reduce the swelling. Um, but as long as there's no bradycardia with the eye movements, um, then it's okay to watch them. We usually just recommend ice packs, elevate the head of bed. Sinus precautions are really important. So open mouth sneezing and no nose blowing. And that's because if you blow your nose and you have an orbital fracture, you're increasing the pressure in the sinuses and in a fracture patient, you have direct communication with the orbit. And if you increase the pressure, the air in your sinuses is then gonna go straight into your orbit and it can cause proptosis. So push the eyeball out and cause an orbital compartment syndrome, um, which could lead to an optic neuropathy. So these patients, we don't wanna increase the pressure inside the nasal cavity because that could then go to the orbit. We don't want orbital compartment syndrome. Um, PO steroids are great. We often give medrol dose pack. That's if the patient has no contraindication. So always look at the medical history. If they have any kind of brain bleed, we don't do it. Frontal sinus fracture, we don't do it. Um, but for routine uh, fractures, steroids are great to help reduce the swelling. And then if these patients seem repair, we do it more than two weeks later after most of the swelling has subsided a bit. Um, indications for repair later, so delayed repair, would be if the patient is still having diplopia. So this would occur, um, you know, if a patient's had a fracture and some of the orbital tissue, so the orbital fat um, has kind of protruded down into the fracture and it's limiting the movement of the eye. If the eyes don't move together in a coordinated fashion, you're gonna get diplopia, double vision. So if one eye is moving fine and this eye is restricted and not moving properly, the patient's gonna see two images and that would be an indication for repair. Um, our our um, journals have shown no evidence for a need for PO antibiotics. I know other facial trauma teams will recommend them. It's up to you to use them, but we usually don't see an indication for them. The next thing to go over are cataracts. Um, this is probably the most common thing that we see in the elderly population. Um, there are many different types. This photo here is showing a, um, a cortical cataract. Um, this is a nuclear cataract and this is a cerulean cataract, um, many different kinds. These are just three of them. Um, but a cataract is basically clouding of the natural intraocular lens um, that you saw in the photo before. And this lens is responsible for focusing the light entering the eye um, from the front and focusing it properly on the back of the eye. And it also accommodates so that it changes shape so you can see up close and at far. But as you age, you have a progressive decrease in vision um, because this lens will become cloudy, it will become more rigid and is unable to change shape. Um, and it can lead to chronic progressive decreased vision. Some patients come in and, and they're actually 2100 or 2200 or, and they don't, they haven't really noticed a change in their vision because it's happened so slowly. Um, so it doesn't cause sudden changes in vision, except in one case in traumatic cataracts. Um, but if they're left untreated, some patients may develop such large cataracts that they will become blind. Um, but it is reversible if we take the cataract out. So that's important to know. Worldwide cataracts are the number one cause of preventable blindness. Um, and there is no medical treatment to prevent the development. This is just simply a fact of aging. It's going to happen. Patients with diabetes or who have had trauma may develop cataracts at a faster pace than healthy individuals. Um, but there's nothing to do. You know, some patients I tell, you know, you have a cataract and they're very upset by that. Um, it's important to let them know that it's nothing they've done wrong. It's part of the normal aging process. So age-related is a common type. Um, pathogenesis is multifactorial. We actually don't really know um, it fully. They'll have progressive vision loss. Um, something to ask them is, do you have glare? A lot of them will say, you know, I'm driving at night and the bright lights are causing extreme glare. I can't see anything. That's very common of cataracts um, and night vision especially. 
traumatic cataracts. So this can follow any blunt injury or penetrating trauma. So patients who have been in fist fights, um, we have patients who were hit with, you know, iron rails um, or construction working, something fell on their head. Um, in a matter of a couple of days, they can develop a white, really dense cataract. So traumatic cataracts can occur very quickly. Um, metabolic. So these are your diabetic cataracts. Um, patients with other metabolic disorders such as galactosemia, Wilson's disease, and myotonic dystrophy, they can also develop certain types of cataracts. These are more chronic progressive, but you may see um, patients with these problems developing cataracts maybe in their 40s or 50s versus healthy individuals that may have them more in their 60s, 70s. Um, so management, first you want to give glasses. So if the patient has a, a smaller cataract, you can often help um, improve their vision just with glasses that will help refract the light through that cloudy lens, but it gets to the point where the cataract is so large, the glasses aren't going to help and they need surgery, which is the only definitive treatment. Um, so we remove the cloudy lens using phaco emulsification. It's a, um, a point, uh, sorry, a 2.2 millimeter wound in the cornea here that we insert little instruments through when we take the cataract out with this phaco emulsification probe, which is a type of ultrasound energy. Um, and we put a new clear intraocular lens in um, so they can see clearly through it. Um, it's very effective. Um, it's probably one of the most commonly performed procedures in America um, and success rates very high, 97% or higher when performed on appropriate patients. Um, of course, there are exceptions if patients have had multiple prior surgeries um, or other issues affecting the eye. Um, patients are generally very, very happy after the surgery. They can go from seeing 2200 one day to post-op day one seeing 2020. It's, it's very rewarding. And um, I tell my patients who have dense cataracts and poor vision, this is a good problem to have because we can fix this. It's reversible um, in contrast to things such as diabetic retinopathy or glaucoma. Uh so... Hello, can I ask you a question about cataracts? Sure. <clears throat> it's somewhat personal. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have an 85 year old man who has cataracts, is it better to take out the cataracts earlier than wait till he's 90 years old when, there's, when they're much worse and there's more risk to you? Would you, can you That's answer that? question. That? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, it's kind of patient dependent. So cataract surgery, we do look at a, a couple of things. We look at, examine the cataract itself you want it to be the um, ripe. So you don't want it to be too small where it's very soft because that makes extraction more difficult. But you don't want it to be rock hard and white. When it's so dense like that, you have to use a lot of energy inside the eye that can lead to complications. So you want to catch it right at the perfect time. And when is that perfect time? It really varies from patient to patient. Um, so that's the first thing you look at. The second thing is how much it's bothering the patients. So some patients have a 2200 dense cataract and they're not bothered by it. I'm not going to go in and do surgery on that patient if, if they're not bothered by their vision. So it's an elective procedure. And I, I gauge my patient's motivation and how much the vision is bothering them. So in answer to that question, I think, you know, if the patient is maybe healthier when they're 80 versus 90, um, that's an important consideration. Although we do the surgery under sedation, so they don't need general anesthesia. They just get, some surgeons actually do it without station and it's just topical drops to numb the eye. Um, and some people do give a little bit of Versed or fentanyl and drop, um, but it's not like they're getting general anesthesia that would be um, troublesome for patients that are older that have a lot of medical problems. Um, but I think in general, it's more a gauge of, you know, what type of cataract do they have? How symptomatic are they? How motivated are they to have this surgery? Um, and, and I make the decision off of there. I like to operate on people that are 80, not 90, so I would prefer to do it then, but it's really up to how much it's bothering the patient. Uh, one more question. Uh, what's your opinion on correcting astigmatism with the cataract lens and glaucoma? Yeah, that's a hot topic. So um, there are a lot of procedures we can do for patients with astigmatism. Um, there's a new laser we can use that creates little cuts in the cornea that can um, even out the astigmatism. They're called um, limbal relaxing incisions, and those are great. That's for small amount of astigmatism, less than 1.25 diopters. For patients with higher amounts of astigmatism, we can put toric lenses in. So intraocular lenses that we put inside the eye come in all different shapes and sizes. And your standard one is a monofocal lens. So it's going to give patients great distance vision, 
but it won't let them accommodate up close, so they'll need to wear reading glasses. Then you have your um, bi, um, your monofocal, your trifocal lenses. So that's going to allow the patient to see at a distance and at near. Now, unfortunately, that's not covered by insurances, and those lenses cost about $2,000 a pop. So um, as a resident program here, we are given 10 of them. So some of our patients are lucky winners of these trifocal lenses, and we can try them on them. But um, it is a very expensive lens, so not everyone can afford it. Um, the other type of lens is a toric lens, and that's if you have high astigmatism. And it's basically um, personalized for you, for your astigmatism, so it evens it out. And similarly, that also requires an out-of-pocket charge of about 1500 to 2000 I think. Um, and as residents, we do get some to practice on, um, but that's something I do like to talk to my patients about. It is an option, um, but it comes down to, um, you know, what they can afford, unfortunately. The only thing covered by insurance companies is the monofocal regular one. Um, but there are options for patients with that, um, where we can completely correct the astigmatism with the lens we put in the eye. If they can't afford it or they're not interested in it, um, we can give them glasses after the surgery that will correct the astigmatism and they'll see much better having the cataract out still. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that takes us to glaucoma. So glaucoma is a very common condition we see. It's basically optic nerve damage or cupping of the optic disc um, that leads to visual field defects and it's all due to um, ganglion cell loss um, in the nerve. So it's progressive, it's the most common cause of irreversible blindness worldwide. And there are a couple of different types. You have primary open angle glaucoma, angle closure glaucoma, normal tension, and secondary glaucoma. Um, and, and just to be clear, this optic nerve damage is most of the time due to elevated eye pressure. Um, often it's a silent disease. Patients don't know they have elevated eye pressure, just like in hypertension, they could be walking around with moderately elevated high blood pressure and they would never know. Um, these patients don't know that they have high pressure. They walk around years with it like this, and that causes progressive loss of that retinal ganglion cell layer and thinning of the nerve. And so these patients will start to lose their peripheral vision and they'll start to look through a pinhole. Um, so in the United States, primary open angle glaucoma is the most common form, and it's the leading cause of irreversible blindness. So unfortunately, once you've had the damage to the nerve, it, you can't do anything to fix it. Um, we tell our patients, you know, we're treating you to prevent progression at this point, to keep what you have. So open angle glaucoma, um, like I said, no symptoms early in the disease. The patients are walking around with mildly elevated eye pressure that leads to slow progressive damage to the optic nerve and cupping of the nerve. Um, patients will experience progressive peripheral field vision loss and they'll develop this tunnel vision until the point where it snuffs off and they'll have complete blindness. Risk factors, um, there are a couple that we found in our literature, age, older age, um, you know, just because it's more time with the elevated eye pressure, um, African-American race, positive family history, um, patients with refractive errors, so myopia means they have long eyes, they're nearsighted, um, and diabetes. And we see this all over. It's very common in our um, Afro-Caribbean population here. Um, so something to watch out for. And here's just a photo. So here's a normal optic, optic nerve and disc. So you have a rim of nerve tissue here and here's your central cup and then you have the vessels coming off. So you could kind of discern that here. We would call this like a 0.3 cup, that's normal. This is a cupped nerve, it's like a 0.9. So if you take the ratio of the central cup to the rim of nerve fiber layer, the ratio is much higher to one than it is here. Um, <clears throat> and you'll start to see thinning of the rim here. And that's classic with glaucoma. And here you can see, you just don't have that pink rim of tissue because it's been damaged and thinned. So management of these patients is with IOP lowering drops. Prostaglandins are our first line. So Zalatan, um, which is latanoprost. Beta blockers, we give Timolol often. Um, alpha agonist bromonidine and then carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, rosolamide. All of these drops have multiple side effects. So sometimes it takes a while to optimize them to the patients, um, but these can be a lot of drops for them to take. The prostaglins are once a day, beta blockers are twice a day, alpha agonists are three times a day, and the carbonic anhydrase can be three times a day. So if patients have end-stage glaucoma, they may be taking drops 10 times a day. And you know, you'll try to hammer into their heads the importance of being compliant with medication, but I personally don't know if I'd be able to take all those drops. So 
these patients with advanced glaucoma really have trouble adhering to management um, and often progress to needing surgical. Here's just a picture of all the different drops. Um, and if their pressure is still high, despite all this, we can give um, oral acetazolamide, so Diamox, um, to help them. But we can't keep them on that long because that's nephrotoxic. So if they're really refractive to all these medications, they then progress to laser treatment um, where we shoot lasers into the trabecular meshwork, which is basically the drain. Um, and we try to open that up for them. And if that doesn't work, then we go to surgery. And surgery, we're putting valves in the eye. So we have a tube shunt here that leads to a valve. So you're taking an aqueous humor from the, the anterior chamber of the eye and allowing another route for it to drain into the, um, the suprachoroidal space here. Uh, another question, by laser treatment, are you referring to iridotomies? Um, no, for uh, open angle glaucoma, I'm referring to SLT and ALT. Um, it's, it's angle surgery, it's different than iridotomies. Iridotomies are good for angle closure and I'll show you a picture of that coming up. Um, but this is more um, trabeculoplasty. So we're, we're dealing with the trabecular meshwork in open angle glaucoma, because in that case, the angle, the drainage is open. It's just not functioning, it's not filtering properly. So by shooting the laser, we help to aid in the filtration, but it's not a, um, a problem with the angle closing, the angle is open, it's just filtration. But angle mm -hmm. closure, the angle is actually closed, yeah. that's the drain. And so that's when we do the, the iridotomies, laser iridotomies. I'll show you a picture of that. So angle closure is the next type. Um, and this is higher prevalence in Inuits, so from Alaska and the Asian populations and risk factors for this are gonna be age, hyperopia. So hyperopia is small eyes. If you can imagine, if you have your eye and it's just constricted, the drains, instead of being open, are just gonna close off more. So more common in hyperopia. Um, the, the primary mechanism here is an acute rise in the intraocular pressure secondary to pupillary block. And I'll show a picture because it's a little bit hard to um, show you. So I think it's coming up here. Okay, so here's a normal, uh, this is your cornea, the front part of the eye, your lens, and you have your iris here, your ciliary body is here, and your zonules are holding the lens. So the ciliary body makes the aqueous humor and it um, comes from behind the iris and then comes between the iris and the lens into the anterior chamber, and it drains out the trabecular meshwork here, and then it goes into the suprachoroidal space here. So in the laser I was talking about before for the open angle, this angle here is open. We're using laser to, to um, kind of increase filtration here, but in angle closure, um, these angles become closed. So this angle is closed. You can't reach the trabecular meshwork. This angle is closed here. The fluid from the ciliary body cannot get up through between the iris and the lens and go into the anterior chamber so you can get a pupillary block. So we can shoot a laser here that is basically a false passage in the iris that allows this fluid to escape. Um, and by breaking that pupillary block, it also opens the angle. Um, it's kind of a complex thing, um, but the main thing I want you to take away from angle closure glaucoma is this is acute. Your patients are gonna come in um, with unilateral eye pain, they're gonna have headache, they're gonna be vomiting, they're gonna be photophobic, they will have decreased vision. You're gonna know that something's going on. Um, their eye will be red and injected, the cornea will be cloudy and hazy, and their pupil won't be so reactive. So this is an acute episode. And this emergency, we throw the kitchen sink at them. So we give them all of the IOP lowering drops, we give them PO Diamox, we do the laser peripheral iridotomy here. It's a false passageway to increase, or yeah, to give the fluid another way to escape. Um, and in patients that have narrow angles that we think are predisposed or at risk for angle closure, we will prophylactically give them laser peripheral iridotomies here so that if they ever um, do go into angle closure, they, they already have this other passageway. So diabetes um, is the last topic I believe I'm gonna talk about here. Um, so diabetes we see every single day here. It affects all layers of the eye and it is a preventable cause of vision. Um, in the anterior segment, um, it can result in dry eye, so corneal surface um, abnormalities. It can lead to corneal endothelial damage, so you can get neurotrophic corneas, um, which then, as we mentioned, if you don't have the sensory nerves on your cornea, 
that um, send signals to the brain to blink your eyes and hydrate the cornea, then your eyes don't blink, you become very dry. You can um, develop ulcers, thinning, and perforate. Um, high risk for infections in these patients. And as we mentioned before, diabetics have higher rates of progression of their cataracts as well. Um, they can also have changes in their vision just because of elevated blood glucose and fluid shift levels. Um, so it induces a myopic shift. Um, and that would, you would see a patient that would come in with fluctuating vision um, in that case. They can also have floaters, flashes, which we call photopsias and defects in the field of vision, um, which I'll go into more, that's more in the posterior section. Um, so posterior segment of diabetes, posterior segment, when I mean that, I'm talking about anything behind the lens, so in the vitreous or the retina. So there are two types of diabetic retinopathy that we see, non-proliferative, which we call NPDR, and proliferative, which we call um, PDR. And the pathophysiology of both of these um, comes down to vascular endothelial growth factor, which is secreted by an ischemic retina that you see in diabetes. You see microvascular changes in the kidney as well. Um, this is the same thing that happens in the eye. Um, you get ischemia, which leads to a surge in the VEGF, and that's gonna cause increased vascular permeability. So you're gonna have swelling in the retina, within the retina and under the retina, and you could have angiogenesis. So new blood vessels are gonna form to, um, to kind of <clears throat> try to, um, increase the perfusion of this ischemic retina, but these new blood vessels that form are leaky, they're fragile, they bleed, they lead to bleeding in the vitreous cavity, um, they lead to scarring, um, and I'll show some pictures of all of that. So on exam, when you have these neovascularization, you have NVI and NVD. So NVI is neovascularization of the iris. Here you can see florid NVI, that shouldn't be there. You can have NVD, so here's that disc that we showed before, but all these little fine vessels are neovascularized vessels, increased risk of bleeding. You can have microaneurysms and hemorrhages and exudates. These are exudates, basically cholesterol deposits from leaky vessels. You can have all of these hemorrhages throughout the eye um, and new vessel formation, lots of microaneurysms here. Cotton wool spots are just areas of non-perfused retina. I don't really see any in this photo, but they would just be areas of whitening. And then macular edema. So as we said, the macula here is the center of your vision. It's the sharpest vision. You can develop swelling in there because of the increased permeability. And then ultimately these patients who have, this is proliferative here because you have neovascularization bleeding. Um, once we treat them or if they're left untreated, they're gonna develop this, which is scar down retina. And these scars unfortunately lead to traction. They pull up on the retina and can cause tractional retinal detachments. And this, this eye here has very poor visual prognosis. Once they've come to this stage, we can do all the surgery we want. The diabetes has won and this eye is never gonna see well. So how do we treat? Well, let's go into diagnostics first. The first thing we use is fluorescein angiography. Um, it's kind of like a CTA of the eye. Um, we inject fluorescein dye into the vein and we take pictures and it shows us you know, what areas of the retina are ischemic um, and if there have been new vessel formation. Um, so microaneurysms are going to hyperfluoresce. Um, you can see here. Um, and you can see leakage as well. So these are areas of neovascularization, those new vessels that are leaky, they're leaking the fluorescein dye here. And this area is all ischemic. You can see there's not great, um, um, the dye doesn't really go all the way out to the periphery here because there's been ischemia. So all things you wanna look for. Uh, we also use OCT, which is kind of like a CT of the retina. It shows all the different layers of the retina. I won't go into it now, um, but we can use it to track the response of diabetic macular edema. So this would be a patient that has macular edema swelling in the macula. And this patient's probably seeing 2200. They have so much fluid here, intraretinal and subretinal um, that needs treatment. The best treatment for this patient, typically we used to do lasers, but now we've, um, we're moving more towards intravitreal injection. So actual, actually injecting anti-VEGF medicine into the vitreous cavity. Um, so management of the non-proliferative type, so that's when you just have little microaneurysms, but you don't have that neovascularization yet. It's basically just conservative management, tight glucose monitoring, you know, encourage the patient to follow up with their primary doctor to really manage that um, sugar and keep the A1C low and control other comorbidities. But once they've developed that PDR, the proliferative diabetic retinopathy, and they've had those new vessels forming and bleeding, then you need to move to, um, 
to more invasive things such as laser. So panretinal photocoagulation is when we shoot laser all the way around 360. And we're basically inducing ischemia back here. Um, we're killing off this retina here so that it doesn't sense that it's ischemic and cause new vessel formation. Um, and you can also do focal laser if you have macular edema. But like I said, um, we're now moving towards intravitreal injections where we actually inject this anti-VEGF medication. It works beautifully, but you have to inject them every month. Um, this is very expensive. These treatments are, can be, you know, $2,000 a treatment. It's covered by most insurances, but, you know, our patients don't have insurance. Um, we are in a program here where we can get them the medication they need without cost, so that's great for them. Um, but it requires the patient to come back every month, and if they miss a series of their injections, the edema is going to come back. They usually need to be treated for about 12 months of total, and then the, that edema will subside. But really, the main thing is they need to get their sugar down. We can do all these treatments, but if their sugar and A1C remains high, um, the diabetes will win this fight. And lastly, once they've developed all that scarring, like I showed in the last picture, they'll need surgery. So a vitrectomy where we actually go in the eye with little instruments, um, we make ports in the eye, and we try to cut off those tractional bands um, to release traction on, that's pulling up on the retina. And we can also evacuate hemorrhages um, with surgery as well, if that's obscuring the vision. So just to kind of close this talk off, um, there are a couple emergencies that you need to be aware of. Trauma, so anytime you're worried for ruptured globe, retrobulbar hemorrhage, or entrapment of muscles and fractures, you wanna call us. Infections, so neurotrophic corneal ulcers, are very common in diabetics, call us. Angle closure glaucoma needs immediate treatment. Zoster with corneal involvement needs treatment. Diabetics with sudden decreased vision, flashes of light, lots of floaters that could indicate a tractional retinal detachment or um, bleeding in the back of the eye, and you need to send to us immediately. Um, things that are okay to follow up in clinic, diabetics with chronic poor vision, it could be due to cataracts, it could be chronic macular edema, they can follow up with us regularly and we'll take care of them. Um, and then lid malposition, very, very common. Um, they are not an emergency unless they're leading to severe corneal exposure, like I showed you in that cradle nerve seven patient, the facial nerve palsy patient, where she was, her eyeball had no protection and was at risk for perforating and very thin. Otherwise, general ectropin and tropion can be fixed with surgery in a minor's procedure room um, at any time. And that's it. This is just a picture of some of my co-residents. If you guys have any questions for me, I'm happy to answer.